Okay, so in these next few modules, we'll be getting more into the how of the PFMA and SQA and L2A. So from this module, um, you should be able to talk about the steps involved in the upfront work for the PFMA and, and SQA. Um, and you'll also be able to define the importance of the site visit, um, both what that means for USACE and FERC. All right, so upfront work. So we can't stress enough how important the upfront work is to coming out of the risk assessment with a good answer. Um, the upfront work are, is the things that we can do prior to the start of the risk assessment. Um, and it helps us have a meaningful and productive discussion when we all get together in the same room for the, the PFMA and SQA. So it's going to include gathering your background information, understanding the hazards, understanding the consequences, and advanced report preparation. So one of the first and, and probably most critical activities is compiling all the background and performance information. Um, so when we're doing an SQA, we're attempting to identify specific vulnerabilities or flaws, which really requires being able to access all of the design documents, construction history, and performance data. Um, so we really want to be able to understand as much as we can about our structure before we get into that room and start to perform the risk assessment. So having all of those uh, pieces of information at our fingertips is, is critical. Um, so this might require, you know, a little more effort than just um, looking within the district office um, for, for those pieces of information um, or wherever, you know, the primary project documents are located. Um, this might include visiting the project office at the actual um, dam or levy, um, inquiring with records holding or national archives, um, and also maybe going to university libraries, public libraries. Um, we kind of have to think outside the box of where we could potentially find um, really good data um, and kind of take that investigative detective approach of kind of overturning every rock, you know, checking all the nooks and crannies. Um, you know, because given that most of our structures are in the 50 to 100 year um, age range, that data is going to be likely spread out in multiple locations um, over the life of that, that project. Um, so after collecting the data, we'll do a detailed review, um, and we want to have a mindset that's focused on the potential failure modes when we're reviewing that information. So when we're missing um, project records or you know pieces of information, that can leave critical gaps in that review that could potentially lead to mischaracterizing the risk. So that's why it's, it's so important to really try to get our hands on everything that's available. The concept is, you know, for the SQA that we use what's available at hand, but we want to make sure we have everything at hand. So um, this is just kind of showing an example of what some of that background and performance data might look like. So you have construction photographs. Those are always a critical piece. Um, this one here shows a really narrow trench in between the conduit and the foundation excavation. So that might lead the team to a potential flaw associated with a poorly compacted zone within that trench. Um, you have you know, some annotation of how the foundation was treated during construction. Um, and you also have your design drawings and your as-built drawings and, and understanding how the design evolved, you know, from their initial design to how it was actually constructed and what issues they encountered, you know, during construction and, and what adaptations they had to make. Um, your boring logs um, and CPTs and instrumentation data, that's going to be another critical piece that gives you insight on you know, strength properties and um, the stratigraphy, and then you know, your geologic mapping. So just kind of gives you a picture of what the breadth of what that could look like. Um, and so the key takeaway is that all the information that we can pull together to better understand the structure will ultimately make the risk assessment stronger. 
So it's, it's really important that we thoroughly, the whole team thoroughly reviews all the available design documentation and as builds and construction records and photographs, um, previous studies, um, so that everybody comes in with that common knowledge. Um, so just to recap, your background data will include your design, your construction, your geology, geometry, um, while your performance data will include your operations, your instrumentation, your monitoring and performance history and understanding the frequency of those high pulls and the record pull that the project has experienced and, and what were the observations. Um, and so these pieces are discussed first because it, it gets everybody on the same page um, in terms of talking about the potential failure modes and, and preparing good descriptions. So again, you know, everybody coming in um, and reviewing the um, information prior to the risk assessment, that's key. When we're all there in the room during that week um, of the risk assessment, there's no time, you know, to sit down and, and start going through the documents really to make the most of that, um, that week that everybody's together. So it has to be done in advance. Um, and these are, you know, multidiscipline teams of uh, lots of different disciplines. Um, and so there's a lot of benefit in those team members being able to cross disciplines and not just reviewing what is uh, pertinent to their discipline, but reviewing, you know, everything um, and kind of looking at things um, beyond just their little umbrella. Um, because a lot of times our incidents or failures are, um, you know, associated with the interface of multiple dif disciplines, like, you know, a, a potential um, flaw like, along a spillway wall and your embankment or, you know, at the interface of, of the embankment and the foundation. Um, so, yeah, having everybody read everything in advance um, beyond just their discipline is, is critical. All right, so understanding the hazards. Um, so when we try to understand the hazards, um, we'll first go over the general concepts of loading hazards. Um, and you essentially have two types of, of loading. You have your hydrologic loading, um, which is gonna be from the reservoir, the river um, that exists behind the structure. And this is also sometimes referred to your static loading. And then we have the seismic loading, which is the load that's gonna be imposed on the structure uh, due to potential shaking from an earthquake. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as your dynamic loading. So when we're doing these studies, we're, we're trying to look at all of the potential loadings that could affect the structure from any source. Um, and so we need to be able to understand how likely um, each of those loads are to occur. So you can take the full range of historical loadings that the project has seen um, or experiences on a regular basis all the way up to the more re remote design loadings that we haven't seen yet and adapt that into what you need for the risk assessment, which is essentially developing a probabilistic um, hazard curve for both the hydrologic and the seismic loading. Um, and those, those more remote design loadings are typically what shapes the upper end of your curve. Um, we'll get into that here in a second. So there's a lot of things that that go into the hydrologic loading cur curve. And um, some of those key components are your historic floods, your observed inflow hydrographs, um, your reservoir stage data, your, your discharge and storage curve data, your regional flood analysis. You might have regional skew information. Um, you might also have paleo flood data. And this is where we kind of tap into our geologists um, and use their expertise to identify any downstream or, or upstream um, paleo flood terraces um, where we can go out and take samples and use age dating methods to actually get a historic point in time um, that helps validate the upper end of our uh, loading curve where we, we don't have any um, historic data points to, to confirm that. Um, so this is ultimately what you 
end up with, something that looks like this. Um, so this curve provides the frequency of the hydrologic bloating using the um, reservoir or stage elevation on the X, or I'm sorry, on the Y axis, and then the annual exceedance probability of that pool on the X axis. Um, and so when working with these curves, we need to, to be able to understand how the physical characteristics of the project influence the shape of the curve. Um, and so you'll notice kind of midway up on the, the, the curve, there's a break. Um, there's an inflection point, and that's where your spillway activates. So you're discharging a lot more outflow through the spillway, and that impacts um, the frequency that you continue to rise in elevation. So it makes it a little bit harder to reach those higher elevations once you're um, discharging a lot more flow downstream. Um, but to a certain point, you know, it picks back up because you're kind of just at the mercy of the inflows. Um, but, you know, you'll notice on the, the lower end of the curve, we have a lot of historic points and our range of uncertainty is pretty tight because um, we generally know what's going to happen. Um, once we get up above spillway, that, that's the area where it's a lot more gray and we have to, um, you know, kind of consider a broader range of uncertainty. So where does it fit in the event tree? Um, your, your loading is typically always going to be in the front end of your event tree, um, whether we're doing an SQA approach or a quant fully quantitative approach. Um, so you can see here, you have your flood loading, and then that triggers the system response and each step that you have to walk through to determine, you know, how is this structure actually going to fail? So that's the one leg of the three-legged stool that, that Andy mentioned earlier. All right, so similar concepts on the seismic side. Um, some key questions that we want to consider when we're developing the seismic hazard curve. Um, is the site class appropriate for the foundation conditions? Is it a hard rock foundation? Is it soft soil that's going to impact your, your site class? Um, if the site class differs by project feature, um, you know, were those additional site classes and hazard curves uh, provided or considered? So in some cases, we have a, a, an appurtenant structure that's maybe a mile away, and it could have totally different foundation conditions. So we wanna make sure we capture those uh, foundation conditions specific to each of those structures. And then were um, other appropriate spectral accelerations provided based on the project features and potential failure modes. So the embankment is going to attenuate differently than a structural gate component. So just making sure that we're tapping into those spectral accelerations that are appropriate for the feature. Um, was the most recent USGS curve used? Um, so United States Geologic Survey, they have a database and they update their database every few years. I think the last update was 2018, prior to that it was 2014. So we wanna make sure we're using the latest and greatest information um, from their tool. And then was available guidance referenced? Um, USACE guidance you can find on the RMC website, the links are all throughout your, your workbook um, and also in the, the earlier slides that Nate went through. And then the FERC guidance is in chapter 18 of the engineering guidelines. So your seismic source zones. Um, the seismotectonic setting and seismic source zones are ultimately going to be what informs um, and drives the hazard curve. Um, and the attenuation of the ground motion differs between the central and eastern U.S. Um, and the western U.S. So the, the rock in the western U.S. is generally softer and more fractured. Um, versus the central and eastern U.S. Um, and you also have induced seismicity considerations that you need to, to make sure that you've looked at. So the point of this slide is just to illustrate that there's a multitude of seismic source zones um, throughout the U.S. and you want to pay attention to where your site is relative to those sources um, and take that into account. So this is uh, the hazard curve that you would get out of the USGS tool. 
Um, so it takes into account the stiffness of the foundation, like we discussed with the site class, and um, how we anticipate that the shaking will attenuate through the foundation. Um, and, and it's also kind of demonstrates how the spectral acceleration could have a pretty big impact on your answer. So you can see the 0.2 second spectral acceleration, which in a lot of cases might be appropriate for your embankment, um, gives you a pretty different answer than what the one second or, or PGA curves would give you. Um, so just make sure we understand what all of that means um, when we're applying those curves. So again, just asking ourselves, where does that fit in the event tree. Our loading is going to be up front. Um, it's, so when we're looking at seismic failure modes, we're considering a coincident loading of the seismic event it combined with um, the presence of the pool. So to do that, we, we use the annual exceedance probability of the seismic event um, combined with the stage duration curve of the pool. And so that basically gives us the, um, the percent of time that the pool is at or above a certain elevation within a given year. Um, a lot of times we see teams using both the annual exceedance probability of the seismic um, event and the annual exceedance probability of the, the pool. And so you're, um, you're driving down your coincident loading um, that's not actually representative. All right, any questions before? I go forward on that. Come on. I know it's a lot to go through really fast, so I just wanted to. Oh, right there. And then, yeah. Hi, um, could you go back to slide 13 with the stage frequency curve? Okay. Um, I was curious why it's an analytical curve versus like a graphical user drawn curve. Um, from what I've learned with stage frequency curves, it's better to draw it manually in the program so that you're not missing out on observed data points. Um, it looks like the extrapolation is like maybe 10 feet lower than observed data. So um, we, we are definitely using those historic points, um, but once, once we get outside that range of points that we've seen, that's where we have to start relying on our analytical, more predictive methods. So it's better to trigger it at a lower stage than like the historic observed points? I don't know if I fully understand the question. Um, anyone else knows? We don't want to about? dismiss any of our historic points, for sure. Um, you might you see, you know, you might have a historic point that's outside the range of uncertainty that's being extrapolated. So you might have a few outliers like that where, you know, it's a uh, particular fluke um, scenario that's not really necessarily representative of of how the project would operate. Um, but yes, the, that historical historic data is is a critical piece of the curve. Um, and that's that's also a good red flag. You know, when you you have your predictive methods and they're showing something outside the general trend of your historic points, that's then you know something's wrong with the analysis. Yeah, so we can just I, call Mike Bartles right now. I know. I, I don't have a, a phone a friend, H and H. Well she's talking about right like right here. Okay, yeah, so on the upper end, one is the median and one is the mean. Yeah, but we have three blue dots that are above where you're like, on line for your 
<laughs> my background is geotech. I'm just going to admit that up front. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm one of the HNH people who works with the hydrologic hazards team at the RMC right now. And when we're doing this type of analysis, like I, I, when I've commonly seen you get a couple points plotted way outside the confidence bounds like that is like, you're assuming that the dam upstream or the reservoir upstream of the dam is kind of like a bathtub and you have to pick a single critical duration to fill that bathtub uh, to get these simulated results. And sometimes when you see something like this, that critical duration might be applicable to the vast majority of those points, which is why it lines up really down there. But then for those really extreme events, you could actually have a slightly different critical duration. And it's a little bit of a shortcoming because you have to model this particular type of simulation assuming a single critical duration. And so sometimes we'll do a Frankenstein curve <laughs> where we have two different critical durations represented and we're using probability theory to merge those curves. Um, but to Carmen's point, another thing that can happen is like in this analysis, it looks like it's only using systematic data. And so we could also look at adding historical data, paleo flood data, precipitation frequency data, and sometimes it will shift those points and plot them in the correct position. It's like another red flag is when you see this, it's like, okay, we should do more digging and figure out what's actually going on here. But the curves are still valid. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question here. Thanks. Um, so this is based on uh, historical evidence and with climate change, potentially these will change. How, how do we incorporate uh, climate change into this whole concept? Well, I would say our most recent tools are are taking into account all of the um, the more recent significant flood events that where we're seeing some of those climate change effects, right? That's right. And you know, it's some uh, I don't know what's going on with this thing, but so that can be a separate analysis, um, particularly when we're planning new structures that we have, like um, for different parts of the region and different we have different studies that apply to projecting climate change uh, and when we design things for 50 years, 75 years, 100 years, we're putting in several estimates of climate change. Um, and sometimes we incorporate that, we incorporate that in our risk as well. Long story short, for dams, which are based on kind of rainfall and riverine, it's not huge, um, but when it really comes into play is coastal systems when we're de designing coastal levees. So that's a really big deal, but good, good question, but uh, it, it, it's variable in how we attack it, but sometimes a separate analysis. And I think we're also trying to figure out what our, you know, the, the methodology is continually evolving. So. Okay, one more question. Yeah, you, you talk about two types of loading, hydrologic and uh, seismic hazards. What about ice loading? Do you take that into consideration? I think that would be taken into consideration and more as a failure mechanism. Does ice loading lead to, you know, failure of a gate or uh, mechanical component? Um, but no, we don't necessarily. Do you want to add to that? Um, we've had to look in Williston in particular, which is um, upstream. Uh, <laughs> All right. Anyways, so uh, so um, yes, we did have to take into account of that, but it's it's really complicated. But you know this um, this artificial raising of the water due to these ice dams that kind of form up along these rivers. It was really tough. It was a lot to wrap our heads around. We also had some aggradation going on in that particular area. So what we ended up doing was we brought in some of our experts from uh, around the country who had experience with ice, as well as some of these other issues. And we ended up um, sort of making an inventory out of it and eliciting how likely we thought this was to um, impact the water level, particularly around the 100 year, because this is a levee system where we're doing an infant risk assessment. Um, 
That was an imperfect way to tackle this problem, but it seemed like it was our best estimate of what that, um, what that could be. Not necessarily a standards-based, but more of like a risk-based 50th percentile estimate of what we thought the water, le water level could be. Kind of like a, a debris loading yeah, approach right. where it's, it's still in the front end of your event tree because it impacts you know, the loading. Um, and and yeah, you have- Different ice loading where you know, we're in Northern Minnesota, we have uh, our reservoirs freeze, you get the ice sheet, a solid ice sheet, can expand. We've had dams pushed by the ice loading. Oh, so you're talking about actual physical loads from ice. Really interesting. Well, I, I personally haven't had to come up against that. That's really interesting. We'd probably be looking to you guys and we'd probably call you guys and say, hey, how do you guys do it? Okay, let's jump over to consequences. Um, so consequences have, has really come a long way, even within the last five years. Um, and there's different resources and tools that you can reference on our website, um, that go into a lot more detail on this. Um, but basically there's been a lot of social science research and, and flood surveys from the more recent incidents, such as Oroville, you know, the flooding in, um, Texas and things like that, that, um, have been incorporated into our approach um, and how we estimate consequences. Um, so our life loss and economic consequences um, are specifically modeled and plotted against the probability of failure of a dam or levy, and that gives us our, our estimate of risk. Um, other consequences such as environmental, historic, um, cultural, nationally significant sites, those are considered, but more qualitatively. Um, and it can still affect a decision and whether or not risk is tolerable. So we essentially have two ways um, of estimating consequences. You have more simplified empirical estimates or correlations, and then you have higher level simulation models. Um, but ultimately those empirical rates um, from case histories are what in underpins you know, both methods. Um, so when we're estimating consequences, we want to, you know, base it on our understanding of the potential failure modes, um, the breach parameter assumptions, the warning time, uh, mobilization, and, and other factors that um, we'll go through here in a second. Um, but for SQRAs, we're looking for order of magnitude estimates. Um, once you get up to quantitative risk assessment methods, you'll want to get a little bit finer. Um, but that's kind of the, the target for, for this level of effort. All right, so here are the, some of the essential elements that we consider when we're, we're doing life loss estimates. Um, we look at the breach parameters and, and all of the considerations that, that go into that, like your geometry and your formation time um, and what really drives those final breach parameters. Um, and then we also look at the incremental consequences for the specific stages that we're evaluating um, within the, the failure modes. And um, we wanna look at our flood characteristics, the flood wave arrival time, um, flood depths and velocities to, to really understand how that downstream um, inundation impacts the population. Um, we look at evacuation potential, and this is a, a really big impact on high population centers. Um, so the ability of getting people out of the way and to safety has historically been overestimated. Um, so within studies, um, so in high part areas, this is where we really wanna think about whether a simulation model um, should be used. And we wanna be able to understand how the incremental life loss changes with pool, um, and be able to explain why and, and also talk to any major sources of uncertainty. Um, essentially, we need to be able to have a good understanding of each of these elements to have a clear picture of the consequences and, and what's driving them. All right, so just show of hands, has anybody seen an event tree similar to this? Awesome, okay. so. This um, is a little bit more expansive than the couple that we saw um, earlier, um, where you have your flood loading, 
Um, you have your system response, which is what the team will gather in the room and go through and elicit. Um, and then you have your consequences. So all of those components combined is what gives you your project risk. Um, so it just kind of shows you what that looks like um, from start to finish. Okay, so advanced report preparation. Um, I know I've, I've mentioned this a couple times already, but the more we can have prepared in advance of the PFMA and SQRA, the better. Um, it makes, the, again, that time that we're all together in the room much more productive. Um, so for USACE, our general approach is we'll have the background chapter prepared in advance, the hydrologic and seismic hazards chapters, the consequences chapter, and then we'll also have kind of our, our key historic um, documents and pieces of information organized into appendix files. Um, so we have a pertinent plates and construction drawings that has your as-builts, um, an appendix with your construction photos, your history of remedial measures, and your monitoring and instrumentation data. That's what the team needs to be able to readily access um, when you're in there in the room. Um, for FERC, the background information is going to be summarized in the pre-inspection preparation report. Um, and your hydrologic hazards, seismic hazards, and consequences um, should be documented in separate memos or report, reports available um, for the L2A session. And um, your pertinent plates and drawings and, and photographs and history of remedial measures and then your monitoring and instr instrumentation data are also going to be included um, as appendices to the, the PIPR. Okay, so site visit. In conjunction with the upfront work, this is the other critical piece. Um, it really allows the team to get uh, much more oriented with the project beyond what you would just get from looking at plans and drawings. Um, and it gives us a chance to talk to the people who maintain the project on a daily basis um, and get their input and historical knowledge which is always um, super valuable. Um, and so for USACE, the site visit is typically done as part of the PFMA. Um, during the site visit, the, the facilitator and the, the SMEs, the, the team, um, the rest of the team will spend a few hours visiting um, locations associated with potential vulnerabilities or you know, consequences. Um, and it's an opportunity for the team to discuss the site and their performance with the field personnel and sponsors in a more relaxed environment and, and kind of get their opinion on potential vulnerabilities. So it's not a site inspection. Um, that's, the, the inspection is done as a separate effort um, from what this is. Um, so for FERC, generally the independent consultant team will perform the part 12 inspection prior to the PFMA L2RA. Um, and the facilitators and other non-ICT members perform a site visit before, during, or after the Part 12 inspection. Um, and so when the Part 12 inspection is planned after the PFMA, then a site visit should be performed by all PFMA l participants. Okay, so we have another learning check if you want to log into Socrative. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with question number one. Loading blank and blank estimates should be prepared prior to the PFMA. The correct answer that about 70% of the room got is C, hazard and consequence. Moving on to question number two, what are some possible sources of background information that should be considered during a risk assessment? Existing project data, exploration data, results of previous risk assessments, national archives data, and performance records for the options. Uh, and 100% of you chose E, all of the above. Number three, is it true or false? This answer is true. 100% of you uh, marked that. Preparing sections of the report in advance of the PFMA SQRA L2RA makes the, most, makes the process more efficient. 
And final true or false question, 96 uh, respondents chose false. The site visit is not a critical step in the PFMA, SQRA, L2RA process. All right, good job.